All right, everyone. The hour is 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. For wherever, wherever you are watching across the world, or if you're watching this pre recorded on YouTube later on, um, we're happy to welcome all of the participants of the Reclaim 2021 conference. It is a virtual event hosted by the Western Diocese out in Burbank, California, but this specific Reclaim, as mentioned, is intended for the whole world to experience in unity with one another. So we're very excited to welcome each and every single one of you to experience all that, um, all, all that will be shared and has already been shared. Uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, Sirpa Zanhair for spearheading uh, such an effort years ago when uh, this Reclaim conference began. All the Derhars who are present and of course uh, Dervaskin who uh, so strongly led uh, the Deacons Council and uh, all the organizational committees in planning this event. Being a virtual event, it's definitely uh, uh, not easy in a lot of in a lot of uh, cases and a lot of reasons. Uh, but so far, so good. Everything's running smoothly, and we're very happy to see everyone. Have everyone here. I just want to go over um, what it is that we're going to be talking about for the second half of the session. But before we go ahead and do that, I do want to kindly remind everybody of the rules for our panel discussions. Um, so just quickly to reiterate uh, what Deacon Dikran was saying earlier today. Uh, so questions for the speakers uh, or the panelists may be given at any time during the presentation or discussions. So just type into the chat box. Uh, the questions will be presented to the speakers uh, and the panelists from Savannah. Um, and then anything that goes during this conference, as long as it's in the confines of our theme, which is reclaiming faith. Um, let's like, for example, um, if you, you know, give an example, uh, kind of like the ones that, that, that I was giving earlier about doubt, uh, that's something to keep in mind. We want to keep it as much in the confines of our topic. Um, we won't entertain questions that divert from our focus. Um, and, you know, in between speakers and panels, we are just giving about 10 minutes. Um, so we hope that you're going to stay tuned with us throughout that time. We want to make sure that uh, you are getting the breaks that you need as well uh, to refresh yourselves. And, uh, and yeah, and that's, that's, that's everything as far as the rules. Um, we're, again, super excited to have our new panelists join us. And let me just start off by welcoming them in. Uh, if we have everybody in here already it looks like everybody has joined us um so I'll, I'll just go ahead and get started with uh an la local um an aba behavioral psychologist uh and a student in uh los angeles i want to invite ani bakmajian ani are you are you present yes i'm here Awesome. Well, Ani, I'm going to turn it over to you. And if you will, uh, you could give a warm welcome of this topic and your panel um, to our beloved audience. Wonderful. Thank you, Deacon Rebel. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I ask each panelist to introduce themselves I want, and make their statements, I wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ani Bakmajin. I live in Glendale, California. I am a clinical psychology doctorate student. I attend Alliance International University. Um, just as you mentioned, I also work in the field as a behavioral therapist for children who have autism and or a learning disability. Um, so going into it, before, before the pandemic, I would attend church a few times a month to the candle and voice my prayer in the home of our Heavenly Father. Um, now I attend regularly. I go every Sunday and meet with a group called Bridging Generations um, every Wednesday night. Um, at a time of fear, discomfort, and test, I grew closer to my faith. Before I would turn to 
uh, social media for comfort. Now I turn to God and through reading his word and his guidance, I feel protected and calm. Uh, recently, I have been juggling school work, internships, practicums, and spending time with my loved ones. Um, I would find myself going through a rabbit hole of negative thoughts and hurtful words um, that I would place upon myself. Um, and I would find myself on edge and feeling hopeless. This is when I was reminded to turn to God. And it's truly amazing what um, reading a prayer can do. I was reminded that God has a plan. We shall put our trust in him as he has put our his trust in us. Um, my faith grew during the pandemic. I was given opportunities to further enhance my understanding of what it meant to be a Christian. I want to thank Sir Pazan and Father Vazgen for allowing me to connect to, con to connect with them and um, in this post-pandemic world. Um, thank you all for joining us for Reclaim 2020. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Carmen Antonian. Carmen, would you please tell us about yourself and what it means to reclaim your faith? Ani. Nice to meet you all. I'm Carmen Antonian. I'm a marketing and partners partner relations manager here in the Bay Area for a tech company. I'm an active member of the St. John San Francisco Parish and Choir. I've also been active in the diocese. I was a member of the ACYO Central Council and I'm currently a member of the Stewardship Committee. Pre-COVID, we would be involved in many aspects of the church, bazaars, picnics, fellowship, luncheons, and now we can't do any of that. Pre-COVID, I'd attend church regularly, but there were always those few Sundays that would conflict with other life events. Fear was brought to us when the pandemic started one year ago. A year ago, Easter was just a couple weeks away when everything went into lockdown. Attending church would not be a possibility for Holy Week and the events leading up to Easter. Here in the Bay Area, our priests came together for joint online services, which really gave a comforting atmosphere. Today, a year later, there's a positive twist to attending church. The pandemic has created a new form of church life, attending church services with a click of a button on your computer. This is not a replacement to physically attending services, but it gives us normalcy. The pandemic has given us the ability to attend church in LA, New York, and sometimes across the world if we so choose. I look at this in a positive light because without the church pivoting to the online model, we would lose our faith. During the difficulty of the pandemic and the war in Artsakh, I've found that having church services on demand with a click of a button has given me the ability to have God around me 24 seven. With churches finally opening up here in the Bay Area with limited capacity, I still have my hesitations in attending services in person. I know I will still be watching live until I feel safe. I definitely think that continuing streaming of our services even after the pandemic is long gone will be beneficial to those who cannot attend church physically and for our elders. Thank you. And now I'd like to open it up to my fellow panelists and hear their thoughts on how virtually attending church has helped or hurt them in connecting with our faith during the pandemic. Appreciate you for sharing those thoughts, Carmen. Um, and as we get our uh, fellow panelists on the line here, uh, which include Vartan Babikian, Daniel, uh, Daniel Hazarian, uh, Deacon David Madi, um, Arnold Simeonov, um, Ani, Simonov and Lori Yeni uh, Kom Komshian. Um, as we get all of them on the panel, I do want to, you know, kind of emphasize some of your points, right? Uh, there, there's been a lot of disconnection that we have felt in a lot of senses uh, during the pandemic. And, um, and I think that although it was not by our choice uh, that all of these things happened, um, it, it, it is our choice uh, how we respond to these things, right? And uh, hearing how you've responded and uh, on you as well, um, just hearing the ways that you have adapted to the circumstances that have been given to you and given back, you know, those trials, given back those afflictions uh, to our Lord in order to work in your life, in order to make something, make something fresh in your life is refreshing to hear. Um, it's encouraging to hear. Um, especially for myself, a uh, fellow Christian, and somebody who is living in the same world that uh, 
you two are living in as well. I'm sure that everybody on this panel and those who are listening to this uh, pre-recorded later on uh, can can relate to that to, to a degree, for sure. Urish, our other panelists. So I want to thank you, Carmen, and um, I would like to introduce Bartamba Beacon next. Hi, all. Um, I'm Bartan Babikian. I'm actually from the Eastern Diocese, um, where I serve as a subdeacon in the at St. James in Watertown, Massachusetts. Um, I am a, a father of two, um, Zabel and Hagop, and um, also, obviously also um, husband. Um, professionally, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I work in the aerospace and defense industry, doing electronics, aviation sort of things. Um, so I guess first off, um, the Eminence Archbishop of Nun, um, Dead of Oskan, Deacon's Council, and um, all that organized this conference. Thank you for inviting me and my Eastern Diocese Deacon's Fellowship counterparts to speak today. Over the past year, there has been a mental and psychological toll from the grief that has been growing like an open wound that has festered. <clears throat> At the very least, we all know someone who has fallen asleep in Christ with little more than an email or social media posts to really process. In the Armenian church, we have visits from clergy, funerals, hoke josh, hoke yankist, which all provide an opportunity to pray for the souls and to process. Over the past year, there has been more loss, but fewer of these opportunities to really attend, um, contemplate, and grieve. The separation can lead to a bottling up of emotions um, that can manifest in all sorts of ways and behaviors depression, anxiety, short-temperedness, short frustration. Um, there's a lot of suffering. I myself lost my father two years ago and due to the pandemic, I was not able to be uh, in the church sanctuary to commemorate the second anniversary of his passing in January. Once the pandemic is over, these problems won't just resolve themselves. The end isn't an event, but a gradual defrosting. Uh, some Sunday, a clergyman isn't going to throw open the doors of the church, ring a bell, only for us to rush back like animals to a feeding trough. That's just not the reality. These problems won't just resolve, resolve themselves because even after we can resume memorial meals and attend hokey yankees together, there are some, there's some damage that will not so swiftly be undone. In our pews, we will look left and right and people will be missing. People whose names we might not know but whose voices and prayerful behavior we've grown accustomed to. But we can work to ease that pain now and process that grief in our hearts and in the hearts of our brothers and sisters. Here and now, as Christian Armenians, we have the opportunity to express Christ's love, to help alleviate some of that grief and in turn reclaim our faith by living the gospel in this broken world. We Armenians have experienced this time and time again to the extent where expressions like Sabbat Danim, let me take your pain, have crept into our language. We can aid in taking away pain with a phone call, a text, a Facebook message, just to say, hey, I've been thinking about you. Here are my prayers. How are you doing? Without expectations of a response, but simply with sincerity and genuine compassion. For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor anything present nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor pandemic, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from God, from, uh, from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. God doesn't, God's love for us doesn't stop because of this pandemic. So our love for one another shouldn't stop either because to quote St. Paul again, love never fails. During these times, we are all on edge. We're all anxious. We're all seemingly waiting to um, someone to say the wrong thing so we can yell at them. As Bishop Daniel said a few months ago, a message to the Eastern Diocese, and I'm paraphrasing here, showing forbearance towards one another is especially important in these tough times, cutting each other some slack from, from mistakes. Um, said another way, love your neighbor as yourself. By being forbearing and compassionate, we can open up our hearts uh, to peace, rebuild our church and reclaim our faith. For it is through our gifts and talents that God has equipped us to perform work for ministry and in turn reclaim our faith by building up the body of Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Vartan. 
Next, I would like to welcome Daniel Hazarian. Good morning. My name is Danielle Hazarian, and I am an Armenian church lifer, as Father Voskin says. I live in Santa Barbara, California, and work in the medical device industry. I have been fortunate in that I began working from the office again in May due to our product being an essential device and my company having a very large space for 12 people. This daily dose of normalcy has been a saving grace. So I'm incredibly grateful to have escaped this feeling of isolation, especially as a single female who lives alone during this time. However, I have absolutely experienced another theme that has been far too prevalent in the last year, and it's been a main topic of today, and that is fear. On top of a pandemic and everything that comes with that, we have experienced more racial unrest and political division than we have seen in recent history, or so it seems that way. In addition, as Armenians, our wounds from the genocide were cut deeper with the war in Artsakh and the feeling of helplessness and abandonment from the rest of the world. Having the constant thought, how can this be happening again in 2020? These events as solo entities are difficult to understand and navigate, but we are experiencing all of these things at the same time. These compounded events are terrifying and have created an overwhelming amount of fear in the world. I have relied on God to keep me from fear. The antithesis of fear is faith, as Father Boskin said this morning. And from the beginning of this pandemic, I have had to consciously choose to have faith in God rather than fear in what we can see. We as Christians are incredibly lucky to be able to have this choice. We know how to walk away from fear by having faith in God, our almighty. Choosing faith is not easy. It's pretty difficult, especially in times like now, in times where it's difficult to see a bright future. It takes work, but I found that you get much more from it by putting by choosing God. There are a few verses that have helped me strengthen my decision when fear begins to creep back in. Proverbs 1, but whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Psalm 34, four, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. And 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God gave us spiritual, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. In difficult times, I turned to these verses. Additionally, I noticed that when I've limited my news intake, the fear in me has decreased. I truly believe the media is one of the biggest perpetrators of amplifying this fear, ensuring to drill it deeply within each of us, enabling and amplifying depression, isolation, and overall poor mental health. Doom scrolling is a new term that came through during this pandemic, and it refers to the tendency to continue to surf or scroll through bad news, even though that news is saddening, disheartening, or depressing. I hypothesize that many of you relate to that term, doom scrolling. So stopping media was really big for me. Social media is something we've talked about today. Another thing I do to stay clear of fear is to not think too far into the future and the unknown state of our affairs. I focus my thoughts on the things I can control, and only look to a few weeks ahead for planning. Approaching our current state and its unknowns in bite-sized chunks and putting my faith in God has helped me significantly. There are so few things we can control in life, so it helps to choose where to put our energy wisely. I pray we have been through the worst. I pray that for the physical and mental health for all, and for more of us to have the ability to step away from fear and embrace our faith. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, next, I'd like to invite David Maddy to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is David Maddy. I am a deacon of the Armenian Apostolic Church, um, and I serve in St. Uh, Andrew Armenian Church in Cupertino, alongside with Deacon uh, Dikran, who is moderating today's uh, morning portion of Reclaim, uh, which was really nice to see him. And in addition, serving with their Datev, who led this morning's prayer. Professionally, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I also serve on the Deacon's Council, Council, which brought me here today. And so I'm really grateful to be here reflecting with you all and being on this panel with Carmen, Vartan, Danielle, Arnold, Ani, and Lori, and so much more we have to look forward to. Um, but as we've been talking a lot about from today's Reclaim Conference, uh, as Armenians, you know, we're trying to bolster our faith in uncertain times while navigating this virtual world that we're all in, right? And the way I see it is we're adding this new them, 
this new foundational rock of the Armenian church during the time of the pandemic. And since we're all here today, everyone on this panel, everyone in the audience, everyone who has spoken and will speak, we are all part of that new them here today. So this panel, as we've been talking about, is going to be more reflection focused. How do we reclaim our faith? But it's also conversational focused. So if you've been saving those questions, um, maybe now I'll start throwing them in the chat box and we can all reflect to them together as a community. And so don't, don't be nervous about that. Just if someone has a question, I'm sure someone else already has a similar question. So don't hesitate to reach out and ask. Um, to get things moving though, as everyone has been starting to reflect, a few things that have been on my mind this past year and in the theme of Reclaim has been this answering the question, where is God? And we tend to think of God as being something out there, right? But he is right here. He is right now and he is with us. And that's because it's through the power of the Holy Spirit when we're baptized, right? And that's what we believe as Armenian Christians. Um, and if we can learn to channel that energy by forging a relationship with God through prayer, through good deeds, we become one step closer to figuring out who we are and how we can help those around us through good and bad, right? And like Father Vasken said at the beginning, um, you know, we are all here as Armenians because of someone who took the next step on that staircase in life. So we could be here today. If you have one drop of blood of Armenian blood in you, that is because we are survivors of the Armenian genocide and that there's through their struggle, that was their struggle then. And this is our struggle now today. And like Surfazan also said, we are walking through the desert at all times and even before the pandemic started, right? So this is our current challenge as current Armenian Christians and talking about the Armenian Apostolic Church as a whole and what that means for us as a community. The second thing that has been on my mind during the pandemic is that the entire time, it has been a season of Lent in disguise, right? Lent began a few weeks ago, <clears throat> but think about it. What are we supposed to be doing in Lent? We're in isolation, we're reflecting. We're forced in this situation now when we have been for the past year. And during that time, we're called to do three things as Verdatev has taught me. We are called to fast, to pray, and to give to charity, right? And not just over the course of these 40 or so days like we normally do, but through the entire season of struggle. And so that's what's been on my mind, specifically, how do we give? How do we connect? And this could not have been more important um, with how the pandemic has impacted the world, uh, more homeless, the jobless, what happened in Armenia and Artsakh. There's so many things in the world that need our help. As Christians, we are called to answer that, right? And so another way of giving charity, even though we tend to think of charity as being monetary, money, donations, it's also our time, right? Like being at this conference right now, we are all charitable in our time. We are donating our time to this so we can learn and grow together as a community. And so we can also give our time to our friend in need, that 30 minute phone call that could mean the world to them to hear what they are struggling through and say that I am here with you, right? Um, so the reason I bring that up is because uh, Jesus says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that fulfills the commandment of love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what we're all called to do. Um, so I can get into more details about how the pandemic went on, but I wanna make sure I share the time with everybody um, and make sure that we uh, continue to work to reclaim this, uh, our faith through these uncertain times and focus on how Christianity is about we, but not me, right? It's a community portion. And, you know, when we grow in our faith, these good deeds, these prayer, 
all of the things that we're called to do as Christians, these aren't daily tasks anymore. They become part of who we are. And that's what I hope we can fulfill and achieve uh, through this conflict, uh, conference. One last thing I heard someone mentioned about uh, young people. We're so excited to see young people, right? But if we're think about it, you know, we are all children of God. So inherently, we are all young. We are young children. And so that's how God sees us. So even if you may feel that you're old or young or whatever, we are all youthful in our hearts and in our spirit. And that's um, who, God, who God calls us to be. Um, we're like that bumblebee that can fly because we believe it, even though systematically we can't, like Der Vasken said. But here we are. We are here to fly. So I'd like to turn it back over to the panel. Thank you, David. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Arnold Samanov. Thank you, Annie, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Arnold Samanov. Uh, I am a subdeacon serving at uh, Holy Resurrection in Seattle. Um, Pre-COVID, I've been serving regularly on the altar for the past 14 years. Um, and I found myself struggling with faith even before that, but with the pandemic rising, um, it's definitely been, it's increased that struggle. Um, and one thing I noticed is isolation and moderation can be a great tool to regroup with your thoughts and to reconnect with God and faith. I think given the choice during our normal lives, pre-COVID, I believe many of us would have chosen to take a couple days off away from our distractions, problems, technology. Some even might have taken a, day, a vacation from society, completely isolating themselves. But the key here is given the choice, we would choose to isolate temporarily. What happens to our lives when that choice is removed and along with our security and certainty of what's to come next? We don't hardly have to wonder about that answer because the pandemic has provided us the scenario and we have our answers. Uh, it would be nice to say that we were all affected equally, but unfortunately, that's not the reality. Some suffered financially, others emotionally, intimately, socially, mentally, and even physically. But I think what unified us all is that most of us were spiritually affected, some negatively, some even positively. Uh, like I mentioned, I would attend I would attend church regularly pre-COVID, serving as a subdeacon on the altar. All of a sudden, we're put into quarantine, and I can no longer serve or even attend church in person. I can't be on the altar praying with my community. And this challenged me because I always viewed the church as the thing that made me Christian. I felt slightly lost and I would even admit I felt I was losing my faith in religion. While I was losing my faith uh, because of the physical church being absent from my life, others were finding it through technology. Like many others have mentioned, streaming services have given us the ability to attend church from anywhere we are. So it challenged my own definition of what it means to be Christian. And from this moment, I would evaluate my life, my relationships, um, both inside the church and outside. Although our church was taken, although our choice was taken from us, being stuck with family, I use that word stuck loosely because some of us prefer it, prefer it, others would like the, the, uh, isolation or freedom to leave. We've also been isolated from society, um, but it's given us a chance to reflect on our lives and improve. Financial hardship forces you to get more creative and to spend more wisely. Emotional isolation forces you to get in touch with yourself more rather than focusing on those around you. Social absence makes us redefine what it means to really be social and active in a community. Isolation gives us time to our own minds. Hopefully this prolonged isolation is temporary, 
and we can eventually get back to a free and more open world once again. But I have a newfound appreciation and isolation for isolation, because when it's utilized to think and reconnect with our faith, it can do us wonders. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, next, I would like to welcome Ani Semenov. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ani. I am a wife, mother of two young boys, Adek, who is six, and Shant, who is four. I have been born and raised in the Armenian church, and I'm a pediatric nurse on a uh, medical floor, which is now considered a COVID unit. And I serve there also as a COVID resource nurse. So my experience in this pandemic has been um, a very interesting one. And while I was thinking about how, uh, like what I was going to say today, I realized that everybody's experience, while we're so tied together with um, so many thoughts of being home and isolated, and there's so much going on, our experiences individually are each so unique and different because of how um, parts of our life play into that. And so just even thinking at the four people in my household, we've all experienced this pandemic separately. Myself being that since the beginning of this for the last year, I still go to work three days a week, uh, which is my 12 hour shift. And I experience COVID in a completely different way because I see it every day that I'm at work and my husband's had to uproot his life and now work from home. And my kids who have a completely different perspective, because for us as adults, we can see pre and post pandemic life, but for our children, this is just their world. Like they have no concept of what this is gonna be like after because they don't get that there is a difference between what happened and uh, what was before and what comes next. And so I think it's really important to remember that we are all experiencing something unique and, and similar, but also, uh, very different despite being so close together. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about specifically is just how we have to remember, how I've had to remember the challenges um, that I face are part of a bigger plan. And so when I got into nursing, it was very much on something that I felt was a calling to me, uh, that God was opening a pathway for me to follow, that I was supposed to be doing this and doing his work. And so when faced with this pandemic and the struggle of what is going on, when I, don't, I didn't sign up for this. I don't want to be a part of this world of sickness at, at work. Um, I struggled a lot with what is, you know, what is this calling? Was this really something that I was supposed to be in? Just to remember that this wasn't part of me being a nurse. It was God's plan for me to be here. I'm a part of this, I'm taking that step on that staircase that Father Rossi talked about. Even though I don't know what's going to be happening next, I don't know how this is going to pan out, but having the faith to continue on, um, knowing that this was part of a bigger plan, a bigger picture, has really brought me a lot of peace and has brought me a lot of strength in times when things have been very unpredictable. We have had days in our pediatric world where we're very busy and, there's a lot going on. And then we've had days where we have no patients because people are staying home. And so we're getting canceled from work. And so it's been up and down. It's very different from the adult world that they see on the news. And so um, the anxiety has been a big factor. And so like um, many of our presentations have been mentioning that fear that comes in, understanding that the fear is only our response to what we know but we have to remember that there's something bigger that is yet to come. And that's the promise of the hope for tomorrow. And so that ties into the second point that I wanted to discuss and just that we have to help our children because like I said before, they don't understand the concept of pre and post pandemic. They had this life that they were living. They got uprooted and we now do kindergarten at home and we have this hodgepodge of preschool that we do at home and it, it works but it's a struggle every day and that's just their life and the thought of them focusing on something that after is very difficult for them and so how do we keep that faith and that hope for something different tomorrow and something better and how do we instill faith in their hearts and 
keep the church alive for them because for us streaming church has been very difficult. Uh, we love it as adults. It's a nice way to take a break and, and focus and be a part of church what we can't do right now. But for the kids, it's really difficult for them to sit and listen. And so we've had to think outside the box and we've had to challenge ourselves and to think, how can I present our traditions, our, our meaning services to our, our kids in a way that they're going to understand? And so one of the things that we've done is during um, Christmas time and baptism, we were talking about um, theophany and baptism of Christ. And so we, we practiced baptizing our buddies, like our little baby buddies. So they had their, their little stuffed animals. And we talked about what, what is baptism? Why do we do this? And had the kids practice. And we've also gone on and my kids wanted to play church the other day. And so they started playing on the organ, on the keyboard and wanted to have bread so that they could pray over it. And they did Joshua Getsuk. And I think a lot of people would look at that and say, this is, you know, how are you explain church and that's wrong and you shouldn't make a mockery of it. But I don't think of it in that way. And I think that children learn and observe through play. And if they're feeling a closeness and an attachment with something they can understand, they are going to connect with it later. So what we've had to do is just be thinking outside the box, trying to incorporate this into our daily life and make, make our church the forefront. Um, and one of the thoughts that I thought was really interesting is like when you walk into an Armenian church, you feel at home, right? You have that instant, instant connection, like I'm home, I'm here. And we don't have that right now. However, we are at home. We are physically in our own homes. And so we have to remember that we are all a part of the church. Uh, we're all part of Christ's body. And so continuing all of our traditions is our responsibility. Um, and as David Mady said, too, we are all children of God. So in the same way, when we have been playing church or playing um, and learning with our kids, we have also been instilling that faith into ourselves and that hope for tomorrow and the future generations. So I think that that's something that as a church and as a family, I would like to continue post-pandemic. When that, whenever that is, <laughs> to just be able to keep learning with our kids and keep relating these ancient traditions that we have to our new generation so that they love and appreciate those same traditions, but make it relatable and applicable in their lives. So I think that's one of the challenges that we have, and I'm excited to uh, see how that continues on in our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Ani. And finally, I would like to warmly invite Lori Yanni Komshin to introduce him herself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lori, and I am uh, an attorney living in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'm an active member of St. Andrew Armenian Church in Cupertino and part of the church choir. And uh, I wanted to talk today about um, some of the struggles I've gone through during the pandemic and the ways that I use my faith to cope with uh, any negativity. So uh, like a lot of people, I have been working from home this last year and I have felt a sense of isolation because the nature of my work is pretty individualistic uh, aside from occasional telephone calls with clients or occasional uh, you know, appearances using Zoom. The majority of my work is um, on my own. And, and I think uh, sometimes that sense of isolation can bring about, or it can give you time to think about other fears and anxieties. Uh, for example, I'm living with my grandmother, which is a huge blessing. But something that I worry about is exposing her. Uh, you know, if, if I go to the grocery store to get us groceries, I, I often, you know, keep my distance and, and, and try, to, <laughs> try to stay away so as to not uh, expose her. Uh, another, another thing that I worry about is, you know, I have family members who are physicians on the front line. And, um, you know, so I, I worry about their health and their safety and the safety of all of our 
uh, frontline workers. Uh, and, you know, an another, uh, a last thing is because I've had more time during the pandemic, I've been looking at social media more often and following the war in Artsakh. So all, all of these, uh, all of these things can have definitely tested me and can contribute to me having negative thoughts. But my faith has been the strongest thing in bringing positivity to me. So first and foremost, I try to remember that most of the things that I'm worried about or anxious about are not in my hands. They're not something that I have control over. Uh, and I'm, I'm reminded of the verse um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, which says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And when I remember, you know, to leave my anxieties to God, this lifts a huge burden off of me. And, you know, I, I remember that, um, you know, my worries are typically things that I don't have control over. Another thing that has helped me is to count my blessings and to count what I'm grateful for. Uh, I think this is so positive because it, it just reminds me of how much I truly have to be grateful for. And, you know, I, I end up creating a, a longer list than I, you know, than I can imagine. So um, I think counting your blessings is really helpful in uplifting you. And, uh, you know, as, as others have mentioned as well, it's, I think it's always makes you feel better to do something for others. Uh, you know, calling someone who you know is uh, maybe living on their own, uh, checking up on a friend or a family member. So these tools really remind me that even during dark days, that God is always with us. And I'm reminded of, uh, of the verse from Psalm 23, verse four, which says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So um, yeah, these are, these are ways that my faith has definitely helped me uh, during the pandemic. Thank you, Laurie, and thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their background and how they were able to reclaim their faith. So I have a couple questions for our group and I'll be calling on certain panelists and please feel free to share your thoughts openly. So the first question I have is with the pandemic forcing many of us to adjust to new lifestyles, with the lockdowns forcing us to adapt to isolation, what are some of the adjustments that you make that are unique to our faith as a Christian. Um, so Danielle, if you'd like to go into it. Yeah, so uh, I'm sorry, I know I'm trying to think of, of a good answer now. Um, so, you know, some things that I've done to just really, that I think are unique um, is, well, church online. I think that's like something that we've all done. That's probably pretty unique. I think experiencing Easter Sunday last year in isolation um, was not with my family at all. And they just lived down the, down the road and was able to watch the sermon online. And I remember thinking, wow, this is crazy, but this is only going to last a very short amount of time. Right. And then, you know, fast forward a year, we're still here, but I thought that it was pretty remarkable. I, you know, talked about doom scrolling and how social media, and we've all talked about how social media can be so detrimental during this time. But then I remember sitting there and thinking, and when I do go on for church virtually and reclaim my faith that way, that as much negativity as some technology has brought, it's also brought some really phenomenal things like us being able to go on there. And I think um, another thing I do is, I mean, I really call on God a lot more now than I had in the past. I, I've always prayed every night. I've always, um, I live in Santa Barbara. There's not a church nearby anyway. So it's always been a distance for my family to get to church, but we do make a concerted effort to get there. Um, but I do call on him a lot more now, uh, just really at any time that the fear creeps in or um, loss of control or unknown, the fear of unknown, you know, it's just, I feel so grateful that we have faith. 
Um, I actually, I talk about it a lot more with people. I used to be a little bit more um, stand, like didn't talk about my faith as much if I was around people that I knew didn't, didn't believe. And I talk about it a lot more now. I'm very open. I wear cross every day, wear it to work, wear it to um, everywhere. And I, and I welcome the conversation um, openly. So I think that's something unique that I've done this time around. Yeah. I'd like to jump in on that as well, Danielle. That was very well said. Um, one thing that I think has helped me, and I think that we're all called to as Christians, is turning challenges into opportunities, right? So for me, it was, what did I do? I was, I suddenly had more time at home to do things that I normally would put on the back burner, or I would normally just, you know, never even get to and, and distract myself, like um, all these different projects I want to do around the house. And, and on the spiritual side, on the faith-based side, I was definitely diving into prayer a lot more than typical, rather than the habitual um, Heidmerd and Joshua Getsuk, like really connecting um, on a deeper level and having that conversation, which is the whole point is to build a relationship with God. Um, so that's one thing that I think we should all do is whenever we have challenges, rather than saying, oh, I wish, or this is so hard for me, saying, what can we do instead to grow from this? How is God using this challenge to influence my life? And I think that's the question we should be asking ourselves today, even. Wonderful. Would any of our other panelists like to chime in and discuss their own thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to chime in on that. Um, I've definitely been doing a lot more, like I mentioned, um, you know, streaming of the services. Um, I bought a hongaman, and so I have hong in my house. I try to do it every week. Um, I've been doing weekly Bible studies now, um, which have been really helpful. Um, they were really helpful, especially during the war. Um, and also I've been reading God Rest His Soul, Aspaz Hokim Favore, Dead Mestro, the previous uh, church of um, Oakland. He had a book uh, published by his family of all of his sermons. Um, and so I've been reading uh, his old sermons and that's, become really useful for me as well so I actually Carmen Father Mastrop was the priest that I grew up with in Oakland and um I have that book on my uh bedside table yeah and open it as well a lot it's a beautiful book wonderful um so my next question I wanted to pose is how do you maintain a, and sustain a Christian life while the physical church and community is absent from contact and I would love to hear from Lori. Uh, how, how do I keep contact? I think, um, you know, we're lucky to live in a time where there's, you know, so much technology that we can use. Um, you know, during the pandemic, I've, I think uh, I've had regular Zoom sessions with all of my family members, which is great. And that's something that uh, you know, we didn't have the opportunity to do before. Uh, so I think uh, it's important to, you know, to, to stay in touch with people using Zoom, using, you know, uh, phone calls, sending a text message to ask, how are you, how are you doing? Uh, I think those, those little times where you reach out to someone uh, is really important. Wonderful. Um, Arnold, do you have any other thoughts you'd like to introduce to our group? Yeah, so um, I think living in Washington, it provides me a unique experience, I'd say from most of our, our panelists and audience here who are living in California and abroad. Um, we've been fortunate enough with the pandemic where uh, because early on, um, our officials and, um, our hospitals and medical teams here, uh, 
have been doing a really strict and a pretty good job of maintaining, as well as our Washingtonians here, who have been doing a pretty, like a fairly good job of trying to limit contact, do, what, do what's necessary to prevent further spread. It's given us an opportunity to kind of open things back up um, sooner than some other people are able to. Um, and we've actually been able to go back to in-person church services uh, at limited capacity. Um, and it's interesting to see how the life, like life around us adapts, um, where you know we're now having to maintain distance uh, during the services, we have to wear masks. Um, a lot of people are complaining that they can't hear the choir as well because the sound is muffled. Uh, uh, von, von, excuse my pronunciations, but um, von is, uh, it's strange to see at first because, you know, we have to do it from a six foot distance now, or it's just one person like our uh, deacon will pass on, pass it on to the rest of the congregation at once. Um, that sense of uh, I guess personal touch has kind of is kind of absent, but you know we're still able to practice our faith. And um, I'd also like to point out that earlier when I was talking about redefining Christianity, um, as many of us have become absent from the church, um, I think for for me personally. What I found myself doing was, you know, reconnecting with people directly around me, my, my family, my parents, um, my grandmother, fortunately, is living with us, my brother. Uh, and it's forced me to focus on reconnecting with them more. And, you know, how can I live a Christian life within my own household? Um, yeah, that's... I guess that's my. Thank you, Arnold. And finally, I would like to hear from Vartan as to what he thinks about this. So in the in the Eastern Diocese, I've seen um, a lot, uh, a great increase in the online presence of our of our church from obviously liturgical services, studies, lectures. This, for example, wouldn't have happened with the Eastern Western Diocese had this pandemic not happened. So we can express our our church and live our church in our homes. So we're taught to bring our to bring our um, our church lives home with us and to live them. And now, because we are we can't not do that right now. <laughs> our 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 church lives are done at home, regardless if we want to or not to. So that being coupled with the additional um, features of, let's call them features of um, online Bible studies, lectures, and um, church services has really been a, an interesting way to add and adapt our, our faith and grow our faith. Wonderful. Do any of our other panelists have anything to add? I'd like to add on uh, Vartan's point about how essentially Christianity, being a Christian, isn't just reserved for Sunday, right? It's reserved for the entire week, our entire lives. And so when we're living in this virtual world, I'm very privileged to say that I'm a deacon and I'm the one serving. And so people see that on Facebook Live and oh my gosh, I can't tell you how good that makes me feel. And I, and I yearn for those who want to participate presently in person. And so, you know, I try to vicariously live through that, um, that moment. And when I go home and through the week, I try to, let me, let me, let me say it this way. The answer to how we reclaim our faith is developing Christian-like habits, the habit of prayer, 
the habit of charity, the habit of good deeds, the habit of calling people who you love and sharing that love with them. And for people you know and people you don't know, right? It's about service to others. Um, I used to volunteer a lot at Loaves and Fishes, um, which is a local soup kitchen for the homeless. And I'm struggle with, because of the pandemic, I was not allowed to go in um, and stuff like that, but how else can I contribute um, in that way? And I think we're all called to live that life and to develop those habits. Um, and something I learned from Dikran, Deacon Dikran recently is that habits don't just show up overnight. You're not just gonna pray once, you're gonna donate once, you're gonna volunteer once, and suddenly you're like, okay, I checked the box. I'm a good Christian. No, 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 no. It's, it's a continual life way of living. And I think that's something that we can do, even when we feel that we're alone, to call back to that we is continually developing the habit of connecting with others, whether it's virtual or in person. David, I love that you said it, that it takes work to build that habit, right? I think that that's really important. And that's something I've definitely learned and have worked on a lot throughout this as well. Is it's that choosing faith. It's not easy and it is building a habit. But as you build those Christian like habits daily, it makes it a lot easier. As you said, I really love, really love how you put that. Thanks, Danielle. I want to add on to that as well too. Danielle, like you said, I feel like during this pandemic, I've talked about my faith a lot more, especially it like in situations like work where I would normally not bring that up as much unless someone else brought it up. Um, I find myself talking about just how I'm finding comfort and the things that we're doing at home. And I think making your faith a part of your discussion and not being afraid of what people are gonna say, I think that's a big setback for a lot of uh, young people our age uh, who have this faith that it's very internal. And I think making sure that we're making a daily effort to create those habits, like you said, David, and, um, have those discussions, not only in the home with your children or with our families, but to continue those discussions, not in a sense of, you know, I don't, I don't know, like just, just in, as a part of your normal daily conversation, it, it helps you reflect on yourself as you're speaking as well. Um, and I find that I've met more and more people that I have been able to connect with, um, because I've been bringing up those conversations, coworkers I normally would not have talked about certain things with, I feel more comfortable with now. And so creating those daily conversations and daily habits that are reflecting our Christian faith and not being afraid to discuss them, I think is super important. Yeah, absolutely. I think the war also helped me start talking about it a lot more again. Um, and, you know, and I know war is not really a big topic of ours, but you know, I tried to used to talk about the genocide with non-Armenians and it was, it's a lot easier to do it, unfortunately, when stuff was happening this year, but then that also brought me to talk about faith a lot more as well. And, mm -hmm. and how we were the first Christian country. And, you know, I think that those conversations absolutely help with even absolutely. reclaiming your own faith, like you said. Definitely. So I want to thank our fellow panelists, and now we're going to go back to Levon, who will transition us into our next panel discussion. And I wanted to thank everyone once again for joining us. Thanks, everybody. It was a great conversation, and I'm glad we could all host this together and share our thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, Ani, for being a wonderful moderator, and uh, all of our panelists who participated in this discussion. Well done. Seriously, well done to everyone. Um, I took away a lot from that. Um, everything from observations, coping mechanisms, and, you know, times of chaos, uh, discovery, reflection, and, you know, even as Danielle was mentioning, um, and really, as everybody kind of echoed, but um, rather vocation, right, your calling, what, what you're really called to do in times of, uh, in times of uncertainty. Uh, changing those daily behaviors. You know, one thing I wanted to say actually is kind of concerning um, the points that we had about discipline. And, you know, I really like that uh, Deacon David, uh, he did, you know, mention something that he learned from Deacon Dikran just recently is that habits are not formed overnight. They're not formed by just doing something one time, by just going to church one time. 
Rather, that's the introduction, right? And I want to reflect on a conversation, actually, that I had with uh, our beloved uh, Hovnan Serpazan, his eminence, who joins us today. And this conversation was one that I had with him back in January of 2020, right before this pandemic struck. And I won't forget, it was the ACYO convention uh, in 2020 that was hosted in, in Burbank at the diocese. And as we were reflecting on the weekend and, you know, taking uh, time to observe the events that were taking place, I had a question that came up in my heart and uh, decided to, you know, take a pick at it with Serpazan. And Serpazan, if you remember, the question that I asked was, um, you know, throughout all of the responsibilities that he has, being such a busy person, responsible for so many different things uh, in terms of managing clergy within the church and uh, all across the world, how is it that you stay on task? How is it that you, beyond staying on task, stimulate your own faith? You're responsible for the faith of so many different people, but how is it that you stimulate your own faith? And I won't forget this response because of how quick it was, because of how sharp it was. And with one word, Sarfazan Hayr said, discipline. As if he knew the answer to the question before, you know, I was even asking it. And he said, discipline. It's by repeating those behaviors day in and day out when you feel like it, when you don't feel like it. And it's a remarkable thing that uh, our faith can train us in that same way to be disciplined. We have the Padarak, the Sur Padarak, which was given to us as a gift, especially for us Armenians. And oftentimes we can kind of look at the divine liturgy and we can uh, think, well, this is monotonous and we're doing the same thing every Sunday. But think about how remarkable that is, is that for thousands of years, the same blessing, the same glory, the same joy. It is, it is truly a remarkable thing that we're practicing our behaviors. We're forming the right behaviors with every single Sunday that we partake in the divine liturgy in the Sur Padarak. Surpa Zanhar, I know you're with us right now. What what commentary can you can you add on to this? Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you, Deacon Levon. You spoke about discipline, which is the most important, you know, act, the method, I think, for us to keep uh, our daily life and our entire life in in prayer, in cultivating within us that thought, that vision that we need to imitate Christ in our God-given lives. However, when we speak about the mission of the church, if you speak about me as to how I manage, you know, to do all these things, the answer is very simple. When I see my beloved people, my youth and faithful partnering in the mission of the church, in the holy mission of the Almighty God, then we succeed. So nothing happens, you know, with one person. It all happens when we all become partners in God's holy work. So uh, all I have to say, partnering with the holy work of God, and uh, I want to thank all people, priests of this diocese, deacons of this diocese, youth of this diocese, every single person um, is uh, a drop, and drops will make rivers and oceans. That's my response. Drops do indeed make rivers and oceans. It is by those small outreaches, small behaviors uh, that we can take huge leaps in our faith and our development as Christians. Absolutely, Serpazan. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you again to all the panelists, uh, especially who uh, have participated with some incredibly insightful points. I love the references uh, that you know I, I kind of heard from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Um, also, one of my favorites um, from Vartan Babikian sharing St. Paul's message of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that love never fails. 
That is something that I believe as Christians, especially uh, in this post-pandemic time, is an enlightening and encouraging message for us to take away. Uh, it's more relevant than ever that although we have so many different calamities and uh, moments of chaos occurring within our lives, it, it's safe to say that uh, that message that love never fails really applies to our day-to-day -day lives. So thank you once again to everybody.